Hi everyone, my name is Kira Ron and I am this year's BA Performance Peer. You may or maybe not recognize my voice from one of the hosts of the PeerCast, our UMTED podcast that we started this year to highlight our incredible faculty and students and Twin Cities artists in our community. And I am so excited to share with you this conversation that I had with Mage Adams, who is a student here in our BA program. And he took Telvin's playwriting class last semester and absolutely just went above and beyond with creating this world and this incredible story. And I feel so lucky to have been able to witness the beginnings of this creation and this moment inside of a even larger timeline and fleshed out project. And so here is the one, the only Mage Adams. I'd been writing before, but it was just kind of like, I got a cool idea, bam, type things on keyboard. Um, and Talvin was really interested in showing us like how to um, not only like come up with like cogent ideas and what we want to do, but like how to individualize and figure out like how we best work, you know, which was super fun. It wasn't like, here's the exact steps you must take to be a good writer, you know? So uh, <laughs> it was very much like, um, showing us how to find in ourselves what works best for us, which is really dope. Mm -hmm. That's so refreshing too, um, and to not have it be so like product oriented um, with all of these kind of parameters that seem to, I don't know, shape how things go. And I don't know, sometimes I feel like in my own head, I'm like, but it has to fit in this box, but <laughs> no. <laughs> It really doesn't, you know, there's so much space that all of these things can go. He like, it was to the point where folks were like doing such cool work in that class, like everything you could possibly imagine, like one person shows, like full scale plays, kind of like, we had this manifesto project we had to do. Um, that was just like the starting writing piece. And like, uh, Talvin was like, if you want that to be your final piece, you can do that too. So it was like, people like there was this one girl who had like a bunch of beat poetry that was going into it like it was so fun it was so cool to see everybody else and of course writing already feels like a fun thing to do like if you took a class like that obviously you're into writing but like having like a group of people who are also writing and going through the same sort of like general steps as you is like so encouraging it makes you want to write more you know mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. Starting with like the people who are like-minded and that's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Okay, so you mentioned that you made some headway on um a passion play you said, right? Yes. <laughs> ah, what was what what's the work? So um the my, uh, a couple friends of mine from my old school and I had been working on like a mythology for like years. <laughs> uh, we were sort of inspired by the craziness of Scientology um, because like there was some there like in their doctrine there's this idea that not only is their religion like the right one like every religion has that but like they said that all other religions were lies like explicitly like told to these like space ghosts. It was this Scientology search. Uh, but, <laughs> um, but I just kind of was like the audacity like <laughs> to have a, a religious practice that says that every other religion is a lie. And then we'd gone into this whole like, what if this conspiratorial and just a misunderstanding, but long story short, um, we had been creating and formulating for years these ideas of like, tangible physical gods um and so we developed a whole different planet and the mythology that works like with reality like you're supposed to believe that it's actually real and that human beings aren't actually from earth and like all the animals we know are not from earth that they're from a different planet and the gods on that planet had a cataclysmic war that led to like the god that created humans dying and they had to transport some people and some animals somewhere else where they wouldn't be killed. And so they were dropped off on Earth, um, thinking these gods that dropped them off thought that Earth itself was a place with no gods, only for the content of my play <laughs> um, takes place in 
Gary, Indiana in 1993, not long after like the Waco massacre, that, that whole cult. And it's a, it's a religious cult that exists in Indiana. And they have realized over the course of like the past 20 years that an earth-based God is going to be born out of the center of the earth in 93. And there's this trans girl who is a part of this cult um she's like 17 and she's trying to like she's just come out and she's just trying to figure her way in the world and her and her boyfriend are trying to get out of Gary to like have lives and get educated and kind of break through the system only for the priestess of this cult to tell her you are the messiah you're the one who's going to give birth to the god and it's a whole crazy thing it's called true body um yeah, so it's um, it's very much about um, queerness, but from a like black and Latinx lens, um, and those machinations. Uh, it's kind of my allegorical, like pol like underlying political like screed against trans medicalism. The idea that a trans person is only valid if they've gotten surgery um, that or, or hormone replacement therapies to like make that happen, which like, of course those are perfectly fine. But like, you know, just the idea that you, it doesn't necessitate those things for a person to be trans. Um, it's a whole crazy thing. And this work in itself is only like the first in a series of other works having to do with this mythology um, and calling this bit of it the earth song. And it also ties into a narrative podcast I've been writing with a friend of mine um, that involves some people from the U as well. Um, so it's uh, it's this whole thing. And I, I really used the class to be this opportunity to be like, let me just like stamp this down, this establishing story. Let me like put this down and excise a lot of these feelings I've had about these like this subject matter about um like I guess I just um I guess I found myself so frustrated with the idea that like queerness in America like as beautiful as like a lot of queer art is and as like incredible and wonderful as it is it is so often from a white bourgeois lens not like poor brown people who a lot of them are queer and there's this conception that queerness is for white people or there's this conception that queerness is um, a conceit that comes out of affluence and education not that it's just an intrinsic quality found in just a great number of people no matter where you look for it so um yeah i thought that uh, a work that involved entirely brown people there's only one member of the there's only one character that's white and even she's armenian so there's a whole conversation there uh, um, and all of them being poor working class rust belt midwestern um in the 90s too so like that setting of like a time when black economic power was just so low. Like it was just seen as though there were only some certain people, mostly in Hollywood, who are able to like break out of that mold. Your Will Smith's, your Jamie Foxx's, your Angela Bassett's and what have you. But then in general, a lot of black consciousness and education was being so tamped down at the time. So, um, and Gary's like a destitute town. <laughs> like, it's like Michael Jackson's childhood home and then released. <laughs> um, so it's this whole thing. There was um there was a, a writer I was reading about from Gary who had called it the town America forgot um, because it has this it, it had the world's biggest steel mill uh, built at it the Gary Works um, and so for a time it was like prominent it was booming it was suburban it was all these things because of that industry and that's still there or the steel the Gary Works still employs a ton of people in that town but like. It's um, it, it was a victim of white flight in the like '60s and '70s, and like when a whole bunch of white people completely abandoned the town, they just kind of left it for the black and Latino people to just be like, "Have at it, have what you have," with no backing, with no funds, with no economic foundation, and um, it's representative of a problem in a lot of America that people don't really think about if they don't have to think about it, myself included, um, but it's real. Anyway, that was a whole. Mm.
long thing, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have so many things. I have so many questions. Okay, I just started listening. Well, okay, I listened to it this summer, actually. This podcast is called Nice White Parents, and it's about, <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. They do case studies of um, uh, school integration and white flight um, in Brooklyn, specifically. There was like a an international international school where they um like taught French to their kids and this more you know bougie part and it closed down and they're like ah and so it, it's just this idea of like what happens when all of these parents do the reverse and go into these schools that have been victims of white flight and take over and it's gentrified <laughs> yeah it's yeah. so I mean <sighs> yeah it's um it's a really good one also okay I'm curious. So, in the plot line of your play, mm -hmm. and what's the trans girl's name? Uh, Coriander. 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 Ooh, I like it. So, mm -hmm. when they tell her that it that she's Messiah, that she's gonna like give birth to this Earth God, is it is it a tactful move on the part of the cult, or do they actually believe that? truly yeah. they believe it the priestess of this cult has been leading them and she just makes this announcement at the very top of the play it's the very first scene mm -hmm. she makes the pronouncement like because um there had been a conversation before Corey came out as trans at church mm -hmm. um didn't tell her parents didn't tell anybody but her boyfriend before that and she'd come out at church and funny enough for the 90s every like so many people in that space are transphobic but the priestess says this is good Corey being trans is a good thing and everybody has to accept it right now which sounds wonderful right but ends up putting this pressure in her own household so it turns out that her transness is what makes her the messiah along with like this we have this weird thing about biological carbon and the idea that like the harbinger had to have shared biological material with the god itself like it's this whole thing of that the god's form has been emerging slowly from the center of the earth for the entirety of earth's existence like the whole 14 billion years but that whatever carbon is a part of that god was some of the formational carbon that is in her that she's been born with that has been like you know passed through systems of matter manipulation like it could have been in plants before it could have been in dinosaurs it could have been in the like floating in the air as carbon dioxide whatever but at the moment that the god emerges in the summer of 93 it's in her mm -hmm. so it's what ties her um it's this whole thing about like um finding a sort of spiritual body. And so when this is plopped onto her in front of the entire community, like the priestess announces that she's seen a vision from beyond the veil. She enters the dreaming. It's one of these, um, it believes in this concept of the dreaming, which is found in a lot of contemporary religions. Um, this idea that when you dream, your soul is actually left you and has gone to another, like to another realm, right? So she she gets her visions by entering the dreaming and she says that she finally knows who the harbinger is, the person who's meant to birth the god and says it's coriander and she freaks out. <laughs> um, her boyfriend like who is a massive skeptic in the church like he tries to curse her out in the middle of church and it's this very big scandal um, and so onward she finds herself crossed between the three forces of her mother her father and her boyfriend her boyfriend who doesn't believe in the cult's beliefs at all period thinks it's bullshit her father who believes it wholeheartedly and loves her and confirms her identity but is trying to keep his household together and his and Corey's mother who believes in the cult wholeheartedly believes that Corey is the harbinger but wishes that she wasn't because she's very very deeply transphobic and mm -hmm. has this deep uh this deep conflict with her daughter um and then all at the same time the play uh goes through cycles um of three scene cycles that you will be 
there were, there is a scene in the church where Corey is training with the priestess, going through like a transcendental meditation to obtain her true body, um, which even she doesn't know what that means <laughs> until the end of the until the end of the play. Um, scenes in her bedroom where she's communicating with their close loved ones, um, and then scenes in the dreaming where she goes to bed at the end of every waking scene and then wakes up in her dreams and communicates with the God directly, um, who manifests itself as the close people in her life, as her best friends, as her parents, and like twisted versions of them to show her like facets of herself in her dreams. Um, and it's like a very interesting presentational style in that like you're not really sure whether the god is actually in her head or not if whether any of this is actually true you're just kind of seeing all of these things and because you only communicate with the god in her dreams you don't know if it's just a dream you know if it's just what's in her head until the end <laughs> um which won't spoil a bunch of the end but okay I do it, so. dang it's so cool. I love that you talked about like Scientology being kind of this like root of interest, right? Because this idea of like, how do we get people to rationalize these things that are from the outside, like so absurd, but right. within it's just, it just is like, that's, that's the world. Like that's what exists, um, it's great, you know? The idea that you can believe in something that you have no concrete understanding of. And sometimes you can be made to believe it. Sometimes you can believe it and then be unmade believing mm -hmm. it, but it's in you, you know? It's not something that when you have faith, it's not something that is flippant. It's in your soul, it's in your mind, it's in your consciousness, it's kind of at your foundation, which is what makes it so hard to talk about these things. Um, and why I chose to frame it as a cult, mm. a cult in the wake of another cult's destruction. Um, this idea that I want my audience to question right at, right at the onset, to be like, what the hell? Is this actually real? Some of our main characters don't believe this is real at all. Um, some of them believe in it so wholeheartedly. They think that they're going to, like, the church's purpose is that the harbinger would unleash this god and create a holy site that get that the forest on the border of gary and lake michigan would become like a new jerusalem they call it that it's gonna be like, like everybody who's around this harbinger and around the god would essentially become oracles that people would like to start a new religion and people would travel to gary and it would be this foundation of the brand new like salvation of the earth um, and it's all very highfalutin, like sec Seventh Day Adventist stuff, where it's like the world is changing. We're actually on the the precipice of something completely new and different. And so that extreme sort of idea, you know, it's different than like you know being like a Catholic and going to church and just being like, cool, it's church. <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> you know you just go on a Sunday and you hang out and you do the sacraments and then you go home and that's just something you do every week forever like if as if that's like what you're looking for this is like a goal-oriented thing this play day takes place in a summer and there you go at the end of the summer God's coming and everything's going to be different <laughs> so um studying a lot of cults that do things like that where they like apocalypticism millenarianism people like religious organizations that are about an event that are saying that there is something coming imminently um and i want to sow all of that disbelief into people as they go through it only for it to actually turn out to be real so <laughs> you know um which then can spiral events for so many stories in the future for it's a whole thing. Right. Oh, what a cool setup. Yeah, for so many, so many things to come. Is the narrative podcast, is that like the story, the same story? Is it the play itself or is it, you know, all of the things that come after um, and the trajectory of everything? Well, it takes place in the same world, mm -hmm. but not concerning the actual events of that play itself. That narrative podcast is um, it's like a time travel, a time travel thriller. Angel Smith and the Death Dealer about like an alternate America where there's a second civil war in the 60s um, 
and <laughs> it actually like the people who secede are from the Midwest and um, they right it's they call it the heartland movement and it becomes this like American fascism in the 60s um, and they succeed in the war and the constitution is uh, completely dissolved and America turns into eight countries with a huge like like absent like middle scape in the middle um, yeah it's a whole thing and so uh, characters from the Union Federation of America what's left of the federal government um, discover their own time travel method to oppose this dictator from the Midwest who's been able to time travel for 40 years. Um, and they send um, an FBI agent to the 1940s to try and stop the events of what of like the uh, Civil War to try and supersede it or to at least be able to come back with information that could turn the tide of the war. So it's a whole thing. Wow. What a cool metaphor, like the thing that's internal in the very middle is the thing that, you know, gets ripped apart and then rips everything apart, essentially. That's crazy. It's pretty dope. Whoa. <laughs> Dang. That's, what an incredible, I mean, the world just feels so, like, fleshed out and so colorful and um, that's incredible. Like, I feel so lucky to, like, hear you talk about it. Thank you. For sure, for sure. No, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that it uh, interests anybody. You know, it's um, it's been so much work and still is so much work, but it's something that me and my collaborators are incredibly passionate about. Um, so, yeah, good time. <laughs>